to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord this morning? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you go and let's join in reverencing the Lord and stand together? Father God, we come before you in this place, Lord, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come into this place to be entertained. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So we ask now that the Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the word that you would have us to hear this morning. That it would be seed sown on good ground as we walk out of this building, that it would bear much fruit in our lives. God, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers. So Lord, we ask that you would set your hand upon all the churches all across the Inland Empire and all around the world that are also teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that your presence would be upon them, upon our Methodist brothers and sisters, our Catholic brothers, sis- brothers and sisters, our Episcopalians and our Lutherans. Lord, upon our Baptist friends and, our, and Emmanuel Baptist, Father, I thank you for Harvest Christian Fellowship, for Oak Valley, Father, for Ecclesia Christian, for Inland Christian, Father. Lord, I ask that you set your hand upon all the churches all across the Inland Empire, Father, and all around the world, our brothers and sisters in Coachella and in Temecula and in South Riverside. Father, that your presence would be amongst them as well. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor, Father, for we are many members of one body, all serving one purpose, to build your kingdom. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Well, if you've got your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter. For those of you who are just joining us, What we do here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center on Sunday mornings is we teach line upon line, precept upon precept. What that means is the Bible was written line upon line, thought upon thought. Therefore, we read it and teach it that way. And now we're continuing in the book of Hebrews. We've been in Hebrews for some time. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, is where we find ourselves today. tell you, the past couple of weeks have been dynamic Word of God, speaking about the Word of God out of the 12th verse It being alive and powerful. Pastor Dan brought an amazing message about the word of the Lord being sharper than any two-edged sword. Last week, Pastor Jim's message about the creative word of God. Wow, going into creating a, a new life for you and I, a life of blessing that all we have to do is speak the word of God into our lives. We have such a power through the word of God. And we find ourselves now picking up in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Now we're going to jump now into the 13th verse. And here we read in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, in the 13th verse. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now speaking to the eyes of him is to God, as we see it's a capital H representing God in the Bible, so that we see that there is nothing hidden from God. That all things are naked and open to the eyes of God. doesn't matter how hard we try to escape sometimes in our lives. doesn't how hard, doesn't matter how hard we think we can get or how far we think we can run, there is no way for you and I to escape the presence of God. God is not up there in heaven with some magical set of mirrors that he can adjust and see down to us uh, small beings here on earth where maybe because of the earth's rotation or the the light of the day that there are blind spots in God's eyes or God's views of us. It is inescapable for God to not see us. We cannot escape from God. And all things are open, are naked and open to the eyes of God. To whom we must give an account. Thinking back to the days of Adam and Eve. When they partook of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know the story. And all of a sudden they went and hid. And covered themselves with leaves. And God said to them, where are you? And they said, well, we've hidden because we realized we were naked. God speaks to Eve and he says, what have you done? And she says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. God didn't ask Adam and Eve, where are you? Because God didn't know. 
Let's understand that today. That God was not in heaven looking with his eye upon his brow saying, Adam, oh Adam, wherefore art thou Adam? No. God knew where Adam and Eve were. When God asked Eve in the garden, what have you done? God did not know. It's not that God was wondering. Maybe he hadn't seen it. Hey, I just wanted to catch up on you. What were you doing today? It was that God wanted Eve to say it. He wanted Eve to know, to speak it. All things are open to the eyes of God. God is everywhere all at once. The word we use for that is omnipotent. Not omnitrans, that's the bus. <laughs> omnipotent. God is everywhere all at once. He is inescapable to us. I love what the psalmist said in Psalms 139. He said, we'll just go ahead and put it up on the overhead. Where can I escape? Or where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Doesn't matter where we are in our walks in our lives. It doesn't matter if the sun is shining on our back and we are living a gracious life for Jesus. It doesn't matter if we have been entrenched in sin all the days of our lives and we have made our bed in the very depths of hell. No matter where we go, we are never too far from the eyes of God. We cannot escape Him. But today, the title of this morning's message is this. Is your account before God? Because although we know and although we have seen through Adam and Eve, although we have seen throughout countless stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the fact that God sees all, that God knows all, we know that. There's a part in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, that we pick up on. And that's the tail end of that verse when it says, To him we must all give an account. Make no mistake about it. Let's not be naive about this, regardless of how you feel, regardless of if you believe it or not. At one point, every one of us will die. And at that point, every one of us will stand before God and give an account of our lives. So today I want to talk to you with the mindset, with the thought of your account before God. And I don't want to instill, instill a life of fear. You say, well, but Pastor Luke, I've made some mistakes in my life. Therefore, am I doomed? But what I want to do is I want to show you some things out of the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, in the fifth chapter, Paul the Apostle is writing, and I tell you, this is a jam-packed, action-packed chapter. Out of this chapter, a very famous verse that we know that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. We know that. It tells us that we are ambassadors in this chapter of Christ, that we have to live our lives according to being ambassadors. But here today, I want to read out of the ninth verse of the fifth chapter. I hear myself popping, so I'll move this. Therefore, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 9. Therefore. Now, if you've been at the church for any time, you know that Pastor Jim has done a very good job instilling into us when we see the word, therefore, it is there for a reason because of what he had just said. Now, I don't have this up for you on the overhead, but let me explain to you what Paul the Apostle had just said to the church. He had said in verse 4 that we are in this tent. This tent means, no, we're not camping. You know, no, we're not out in the wilderness and we're dwelling in a tent. He refers to our body, the being, who we are today, this life that we have as being in a tent. And he says, though we are in this tent... We groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life, everlasting life he speaks of. And he goes on to say, now he, who, he has prepared for us this very given thing that is God, who has also given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent 
from the Lord. Paul the Apostle says that we know that there is a time now that you and I are at home in the body. We are alive today. We are existing in who we are. That is inarguable. We all understand that. And what he is saying in this point is he's saying that while we are here today, we are absent from the presence of the Lord. Why? Because you and I are not standing before the throne of God at this given time. Though the Spirit of God is with us, we are not absent from God. We are not standing in the presence of God. So he goes on to say, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse number 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He says we are confident, well pleased that there will be a time when we will no longer be in our body. We will no longer be who we are. We will no longer wear the flesh that we wear because this will pass away. The Bible tells us that all flesh is grass and at some point you and I will all die. It is inescapable. Nobody has beaten death yet save Jesus Christ. So there will be a time when each and every one of us will die. And the Bible tells us that when we are absent from this body, then we will be present before the Lord. So now, going back to where we started in verse number 9, Paul the Apostle picks up and he says, Therefore, because of what I just said, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Speaking of God. Verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Verse number 11. Therefore, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciousness. Verse number 9, he goes back to say, because there will be a time when you and I will pass on, and we will be at the presence of God, we will stand before God, make no mistake about it, your wife, your husband, your children, your friends, your family, your possessions, your cars, your home, your money, everything you have, you will leave behind. And there will be a time when you stand before God absent now from the body, but now present before the Lord. And you will give an account before God. Like God said to Eve in the garden, what have you done? God will ask you and I, what have you done with your life? And you and I will give an account of what we have done while we were here on this earth, while we spent our time, while there was air in our lungs, how did we live our lives? And I don't know about you, but I want to, when I stand before God alone, want to be able to raise my head high and say, like he said in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse number nine, Lord, I live my life to please you. I made it my aim to live a life that pleases you and that my account would be good. You and I have a choice today, each and every day of our lives, to live our lives of one of two ways, in fear for this account that we will give before God, to live in terror and in trembling, saying, did I make it? Did I do enough? Did I, get, did I do enough to get by? Or we can do what Paul the Apostle said, to make it our aim to be well-pleasing to God. Like a child to his father who was well-pleasing, when he goes before his father, he is not afraid to address his father. Why? Because he knows he has been pleasing to him. Whereas a disobedient child might come with reluctancy before their father. So we have a decision to live a life to where we might decide to try to just get enough to try just to do enough to scrape by. My wife and I were talking about how many people have said, oh, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to sow my wild oats. And on that day before I die, I'll pray that glorious prayer and accept Jesus into my heart. The problem with that we were talking is that Hebrews 4th chapter, verse number 12 tells us that the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. And we have to live a life not to... Say, oh, but I gave you my heart, but Lord, rather, I live a life that was my aim. As long as I had air in my lungs to be well-pleasing to you. 
when the day of accountability comes before God, we can say, God, I, aim, I made it my aim to be well-pleasing to you. So this morning, with that thought in mind, I've got some things that the Lord spoke to me in my studies about how to be well-pleasing to him. If we are to make it our aim, how is it then that we should be well-pleasing to God? And there are so many things that you and I could, th could speak about. There are so many different topics that we could touch on. But today, I have a few of them that I believe, if we grab a hold of these, we can be well-pleasing, live a life pleasing to God. So that when the day of accountability comes for us, when the day of judgment comes for us, we can hold our heads up high and say, God, I lived a life like you asked me to. I lived a life pleasing to you. Now each of these points starts with the word commit. Why is that? Because the life that we live is a commitment to live pleasing to the Lord. We can't make the decision today, oh, well, I'm going to serve God today, but tomorrow do our own thing. Oh, next week I'll come back and, oh, okay, I'll do it this week and then three months later I'll come back and make sure I keep up on it. But rather it's a commitment. It's an effort that you and I have to make each and every day to commit to do these things, to live a life that is well-pleasing to the Lord. Are you guys ready to get into the Word this morning? Number one for this morning on how to be well-pleasing to him, number one is to commit to honor the Lord. When we place a face value on God, hear me, when we place a face value on Jesus, listen, listen, when we place a face value upon the Holy Spirit, we lose out on who God really is. You see, God is more, more than just a value. God is more than just some being up there, a slot machine in the sky that we go to when our times are hard. The Holy Spirit is more than just goosebumps during a song. Jesus Christ is more than just somebody who came and taught and died on a cross. And when we lose the reverence and the respect that God commands us to have, we lose the lifestyle that lives honorary and pleasing to him. And we have got to commit each and every day to honor the Lord. Now in the book of, book of 1 Peter, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me there. If you have a ribbon in your Bible, you can put it there because we will come back to the book of 1 Peter in the first chapter. The first Peter, chapter 1. Peter, oh, how I love Peter. If there's anybody that we can relate to, sometimes I think it's Peter. Paul the Apostle, while he was a terrorist before, he was a holy man, but sometimes it seems that Peter had his shortcomings that kept us saying, I can do this. I can, if Peter can make it, I can make it. <laughs> so here Peter, the great teacher now, after the Holy Spirit has come upon him, Peter becomes the, the head of the church, the first church. And here Peter writing says in verse number 18 of the first chapter, verse number 17, excuse me. And if, and if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges each according to each work. Let's pause right there. Peter says first and foremost, if you call on God. We know it's a decision. But then he goes on to say, who without partiality, God plays no favorites, judges according to each one's work. There again we see that theme of accountability, of standing before God in judgment, he says, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Here's an interesting thought. We just read the words of Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians. And Paul the Apostle gave us the idea that this is a temporal time, that our bodies are like a tent. A tent is not designed to be a permanent place of dwelling. 
It does not have the, the ability to withstand the storms continued. It can give you shelter in a temporary time when you camp or when you stay, but it is not designed to live the days of your life in. And here he says that our life is, is, is short. And there will be a time when we stand before the Lord and now all of a sudden we read from another great teacher the exact same theme. And he says to you and I, and he says, if you call upon God who will judge us, there's that theme of accountability. He says, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay. Again, re referring to a temporal time. Without the t throughout the time of your stay here, to conduct yourselves in fear. The fear of the Lord, you see, keeps us in righteousness. Just as a child to his father, the fear of a child to his father keeps him from doing things that his father tells him to not do. If my father, as a child, was standing over me and there were things that my father had told me, I don't want you to do this, while my father was there next to me, don't you know I would not do that? There are things in my life as a child, as a teenager, that I did not do for fear of my father. Why? Not because my dad was abusive or because I knew he would beat or harm me, but rather because I was afraid of the consequences that I might face because of the actions that I took. And when you and I live a life of fear for the Lord, don't you know that keeps us in a life of righteousness? That keeps us in a life that is well-pleasing to Him rather than doing the things that are contrary to what God has for us. Are you with me in the house this morning? We have got to commit to honoring the Lord. In Proverbs, the 15th chapter, in the 33rd verse, I'll just put it up on the overhead, it says this, it says that the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Do you know what humility says? Humility says it is more important for me to please God than for me to please myself. That's what humility says. And for us to live a life of fear before the Lord says it is more important for me to live a life well-pleasing to God than it is to live a life well-pleasing to me. Because the Bible tells us that our flesh and our spirit are at war with each other. And that the things of this flesh, the Bible says to be carnally minded is, to, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life. And so if we live a life that is well-pleasing to us, we live a life that is contrary to to that that is well pleasing to God. And when we live a life, like it says, the fear of the Lord, that is the instruction of wisdom. When we grab a hold of the words of the Lord and we take those into instructions and we follow them and live our life according to the instruction of wisdom, we live a life of humility that says God is more important than I. And God's will is more important than my will. God being pleased is more important than I being pleased. And when we live a life of fear, we live a life that blesses, that is blessed by God, that is ordained by God, that is anointed by God, that is well-pleasing to God. We're talking today on how to be well-pleasing to Him. Number two this morning, we have got to commit to guard our heart. Commit to guard your heart. You know... It's no secret to us that Jesus and the Word of God says that where our treasure lies, there our heart lies also. Where we put our time, where we put our effort, where we put our money, where we put the, 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 the moments of our lives, our memories, whatever it might be, there is where our treasure lies also. And if we don't guard our heart, the inside, the spirit, of, uh, the spirit inside of us, if we don't guard what we feed into that, don't you know that we live a life, we run ourselves the risk of living a life that is not pleasing to God. And we have got to commit to guard our heart, to commit to guard what we feed into our soul, what we feed into the inside, into the depths of man. We were just there in Proverbs in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, in the 20th verse, we read this. It says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes, the words of God. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them. We want to live a prosperous life, a blessed life, a life that is not down and out and depressed, 
but up and full of joy to keep the words of God in, a, in the midst of our hearts. They are life to those who find them and health to their flesh. Verse number 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. You and I have got to keep and watch what we feed into our heart, the inner man, the spirit of, of, of our bodies, of our souls. It's no, you know, we know in Jesus, in, in, Matthew, the, in, in Matthew the fifth chapter, that Jesus, as he's teaching, Jesus says this amazing statement, and he says, shocking statement. He says that if a man looks at a woman lustfully in his eyes, he has committed adultery with her in his heart. But how can that be? If the man has not taken physical action with the woman, how can he have then committed adultery with her? But you see, Jesus knows the condition of man's heart. Jesus knew that the word tells us that out of the heart spring the issues of life. Jesus knows that the word of God says that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. And so he says, using that example... If a man was to allow his spirit, his soul, his, his, his inside to be fed with the lust, the desires of his flesh, if that man is to be taken and put into a circumstance that would lead him to making bad decisions because he has fed himself the garbage of this world, the lusts of the flesh, that man might be inclined to take action if he was put into that situation. Because out of the heart, spring the issues of life. So you see this is deep. It goes beyond just the superficial, the, the, the surface level. That all things are open and naked to the eyes of God. God doesn't just see us in our flesh. God sees us in our hearts. Hebrews, the fourth chapter and the twelfth verse, I've already said it once, says that the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And we have got to guard what we put into our heart. Are we feeding our heart rubbish, garbage, the, the, the smut that we find on TV that they call sitcoms these days, the language of the music? Are we, are we feeding into our lives the gossip of our workplaces, of our friends? Because if we are, out of that springs the issues of life. And what we feed into our spirit will become, will be reflected on the outside of our lives. And how can we then live a life that is honored, that gives honor to God, that is well pleasing to God, so that our account might be uh, favorable in the eyes of God? How can we do so if we are feeding garbage into our hearts? Can't be done. We've got to guard what we put into our hearts. Are you guys with me this morning? It's heavy, I know. But you know, it goes much further than just TV. It goes much further than just magazines and, and books, whatever it might be. How about how you deal with people? How about how you love people? God says that we have got to guard our hearts. How about when we have bitterness in our heart? Because somebody hurt us. How about we have, when we have unforgiveness in our heart because somebody wronged us? How about when we maintain envy or strife in our heart and we feed that in our lives because of somebody else's success over our own? We have got to guard our hearts, church, because what we put in is what comes out of us. And if we want to live a life that pleases God, we have got to be cautious of what we feed the inside. And I know that you've been hurt. I have been hurt. My family has been hurt. And it is easy for you and I to build up that wall of defense and say, they hurt me. They stabbed me. They took from me. And I can't love people because I have been wounded by too many people. You know, the Word of God says that, that the Lord would never give you anything that you couldn't handle. But you know what we say a lot of times? Man, I can't handle that person. Guess what? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the love of God that works inside of you, through the renewing, through the regeneration of your spirit, being born into the family of God, you can handle that person. Jesus Christ, such a tough verse. It's one of those verses in the Word of God that we probably all wish we never read. Says to turn the other cheek. It's tough. But when we do that, we let it go. 
We can't harbor unforgiveness because somebody spoke out against us. We can't harbor bitterness because somebody said something about us. We can't harbor strife in our hearts and feed that because of what has happened around us. Because if we do, it brings us down and it draws us out. Let me show you what the Word of God says about that. I'll put it up on the overheads for you in James, the third chapter, verse number 14. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom doesn't descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and everything, evil thing, are there. How can we expect to live a life pleasing to God when we harbor these things in our hearts? And it says that these things are fleshly. These things are worldly. These things are demonic. We bring these into our hearts. We allow them into our hearts. We don't guard what we put into our hearts. We don't examine how we act and how we respond. And we feed the beast of bitterness and of envy. We find ourselves broken and disgusted and wonder why we aren't living a life blessed by God. We find ourselves, wonder ourselves why when we stand before God says, what have you done? He says, God, I tried to live a life. Well, what about the bitterness you had here? What about the unforgiveness you had here? I forgave you when you didn't love me. The Bible says that Christ died for us even though while we were still sinners, Christ died. If we want to live a life well-pleasing to God, why not follow the example that God set before us by giving us Jesus Christ? To die for us while they persecuted and spit on him, yet he loved them enough to death. Are you guys with me today? We're talking about a life, how to live well-pleasing to him. Number three, can we handle one more? Can we get through one more? Number three, how to be well-pleasing to him. Commit to keep yourself Pure and holy. Hello. You thought I wasn't going to go there. You thought I was going to keep it at the heart. I was going to talk. No, 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 no. If we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Number three today is you and I have got to commit to keeping ourselves pure and holy. A life that is pleasing to God. You know, we had to keep and guard what we put into our heart. You know, our heart is the inside of who we are. It is the inner workings of man. Now I redress the outer workings of man. And who you once were, you no longer are. Amen? How you once spoke, you no longer speak. How you once thought, you no longer think. Okay, let me take it a little further for some of you. What you once smoked, you don't smoke. What you once drank, you don't drink. What you once sniffed, you don't sniff. What you once read, you don't read. Why? Because you and I have got to commit to keeping ourselves this vessel, this tent, this body, the Bible says this temple of the Holy Spirit, clean, pure, and holy. Amen? We were there just a moment ago in 1 Peter. A few verses from where we were, 1 Peter, the first chapter, now in verse 22. He goes and says, since you have purified your souls. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought that God purified my soul. You are a three-part being. You are a body, you are a spirit, and you are a soul. When you give your heart, you give your life to Jesus Christ. You are born again in spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So your spirit has been renewed, but your soul, your mind, your will, your thinking, your emotions, the inner man, Hey, 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 you have got to purify your soul. And he goes on to say, since you have purified your souls, how? How do I purify my soul, Pastor Luke? Ha, listen, in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, 
but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. You and I have to continually purify our souls. How? By being obedient to the word of God in our lives. When we follow the word of God, when we listen to the word of God, when we grab a hold of it and accept it as truth, we begin to purify our thoughts. We begin to purify our inside. And our outside reflects what the inside has done. One more verse for this morning. In Romans, the 12th chapter, we know this verse. But before I read it, we have a daily decision to guard our hearts and bridle our tongues and pay attention to our actions and our thoughts. We have got to commit to keeping ourselves pure and holy. Now in Romans, the 12th chapter and the second verse, we know this verse. It's a popular verse. It's a well-known verse. Let's go and put it up on the overhead. It says this. It says, do not be conformed to this world. You and I are not designed, if we live a life that is well-pleasing to God, you and I are not called to live a life that blends in. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. You renew memberships. You renew passes. You renew credit cards. You renew magazine prescriptions. Why? Because they expire. Your mind will reset itself back to its natural tendencies. You and I have got to be transformed through the Word of God by renewing, by continually going back to what the Word of God says, by keeping ourselves pure and holy. And when those old thoughts come up, when those old tendencies come back, when those old addictions creep themselves back into our lives, we have got to renew our minds that we may prove that what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you know that when you live a life that is pleasing to God, that you are living a life that shows the good, that shows the acceptable, that shows the perfect will of God? When you and I renew our minds, when we say, what does the word of God say about my actions? What does the word of God say about my thoughts? What does the word of God say about what I'm watching? What does the word of God say about what I'm saying? And we continually renew our minds, renew our thoughts, renew who we are. We commit ourselves to staying pure and holy before God. And therefore, we live ourselves a life that is pleasing to Him. Ultimately, we all stand before God. We can't escape it. We will be there all one day alone. You can bury whatever you want in your casket. You can throw $100 bills and cigars and phones or whatever it might be. They will stay there. But you will go before God. And God will ask you, what have you done? You have the decision in life to say, God, I tried. Or you can say, God, I made it my aim. God, I made it my life's purpose to be well-pleasing to you. Now let me say this. You may have come into this place from the moment you were born till this day. You may have been living a life. That is contrary to pleasing God. But let me tell you something. The word of God says that his mercies are new every morning. The word of God says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. So let me tell you something. It is not too late to get serious with God and commit to him. Three things we talked about today and how to live a life well-pleasing to him. Number one, to commit to honor the Lord. Number two, to commit to guard your heart. Number three, to commit to keep yourself pure and holy. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? <laughs> praise God, praise God. Listen, there's one more thing I want to do today. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you to remain seated. Let me tell you why I asked that, why we asked that here at the church. Because the Holy Spirit's going to minister to us in a moment. And I want to ask this question. The Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. But when you get up, when you walk around, when your phone rings, people watch you. They don't listen to words being said. 
They don't pay attention to the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you, have a, just a bit of reverence just for a few more moments as I ask this question. I want to ask you this question. It would be a shame for us to have service today to talk about the accountability that we have before God and to not know this, if you were to go to heaven or hell. So let me ask you this question today. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, heaven forbid that be the case, but if you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a simple question. Nobody can answer that question except between you and God. Not, not the person next to you doesn't know. Nobody knows but you and God. And each and every one of us have got to examine our hearts and our lives to see where do we go from here. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I think I'll get to heaven. I sure hope I get there. I want to get there. Can you show me the Word of God where it says that because you think that you're going to get to heaven, you'll find yourself there? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you hope that you're going to find yourself in heaven, that you get there? Can you show me the where it says in the Word of God that because you genuinely desire, you want it bad enough, therefore you'll get it. Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God that you're going to get to heaven because of that? Like some kind of psycho-cybernetics type thing. No, you won't find that in the Word of God. Well, but you know, but Pastor Luke, I was baptized as a child. I was christened as a baby. I attended Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. My parents took me to church on Christmas and on Easter all my life. They told me I was a Christian all my life. I've professed or called myself to be a Christian. So doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because your parents baptized or christened you as a baby, because they took you to church on Christmas and on Easter, because they told you you were a Christian? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because you have given yourself a title, you have professed to be, named yourself as a Christian, that that means you're going to get in heaven? Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere will you find that. That's like me saying, I'm a Honda Civic, and I stand in my garage and profess to be a Honda Civic. At no point in my life will I ever be a Honda Civic. Why? Because that's not who I am. There's more to just giving yourself a title. There's more to just sitting in a service once, twice a year. God's not after your penance. God's not after the fact that you've sat in service so many times in your life, therefore you've made it. There's more to it than that. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, I wasn't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, or any other type of world religion, so wouldn't that mean then by default that I, I'd get to heaven? Because that's what we believe. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, or any other type of world religion, that that means that you default yourself into going to heaven? Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the Word of God. Nowhere will you find it. Nowhere will you find in the Word of God that because you live in America, because the money that you carry in your wallet says in God we trust, will you get your way into heaven? Because America was once a Christian nation means that you're going to find your way into heaven. Nowhere can you base that in Scripture off of. Well, 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 but Pastor Luke, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. Good people go to heaven. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that good people go to heaven? That because you've never robbed the 7-Eleven, because you've never cheated on your taxes, because you've done more good in your life than bad, means that you're going to get to heaven. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that? Nowhere will you find that. As a matter of fact, the Word of God tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own will ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's just not that way. And here I am. I stand before you today. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth, to tell you like it is, to shake you from what people have told you so that you can get yourself right with God and ensure that you're getting into heaven. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, I served in the children's ministry. I, 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 I worked in the youth ministry at my last church. I sang in the choir. I was an usher. I have a card in my wallet that says I was a member to a church. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because you served in the children's or the youth or you sang in the choir of your last church, you were an usher, that you're going to find your way in heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Nowhere will you find that. But, but Pastor Luke, I know who God is. I know who Jesus is. I know about Moses, about Jonah. I've even memorized John 3.16 and a few other verses. 
Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you know who God is, because you know who Jesus is, that you're going to find your way into heaven? You know, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is. They know who Jesus is, yet they don't find themselves in the heaven. The Bible tells us that the devil knows Scripture when he tempted Jesus Christ. He quoted it to him. So therefore, the devil knows the Scripture, but yet he's not going to find himself in heaven because he's memorized some memory verses. Guys, there's more to it than that. You know, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the book of John in the third chapter. The Bible tells us that Nicodemus was of the Pharisees, a leader of the Jews. What does that mean? That means that that tells us Nicodemus dedicated at least the first 18 years of his life to studying and memorizing the scripture. Nicodemus was welcome into any temple to preach, to teach the word of God as he knew it. He gave to the sick and to the poor. He wore all the right clothes. He said all the right things, and he did all the right things. And you would think that when Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the book of John in the third chapter and asks Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven, that Jesus would look to Nicodemus and say, pat on the back, man, you just keep on going. Great is your reward in heaven, Nicodemus. But Jesus Christ looks to Nicodemus and he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does born again mean? You've heard that term, you think radical, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. Look at me, look at me, everybody. God's not after your mental ascent towards Him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who He is. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. You know, in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ speaking to the church, people like you and I sitting here, hearing the word of God, Jesus Christ speaks to the church and he says to them, I know your works. Remember we saw, we can't escape God. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whoa. What does that mean? Jesus Christ says, when it comes time for you to give account of your life, he better find you hot or cold, because if he finds you lukewarm, he will spit you out. And what the translation means, that he will cast you out of the kingdom of God as worthless. A shocking statement designed to get our attention. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define that in your relationship with God. Lukewarm means this, that... According to your relationship with God, you're a little bit up in your relationship, you're a little bit down, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, casual. You know, occasional church attendance, a token prayer here and again, doing some of your own thing instead of God's thing. You're riding the fence right down the middle. You got too much of God in you to enjoy the world. You got enough of the world in you to where you can't fully enjoy the things of God. Jesus Christ says, if I find you lukewarm, you are deceived in thinking you're making it into heaven. Strong word. So now then what do we do? How do we get there? You say, Pastor Luke, you find God your way, find God my way, we'll all get there the same. You know what? Let's not do it that way. Let's not do it your way. Let's not, let's not do it my way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody, nobody goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it your way. Let's not get to heaven my way because we can't get, that, get it there. We can only go through God, through Jesus Christ. So here's what I'm going to do in a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on my Bible. Make a real loud noise like that. And when I smack my hand on my Bible on that third count, if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, in a moment I want you to be bold and put your hand up. If you, if you aren't sure, maybe you did it as a child. Maybe you did it, but you can't remember. You need to get your hand up in a moment. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, you've been running from God instead of to God, in a moment, I want you to get your hand up. Why is that? Because Jesus said this, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. You say, Pastor Luke, if I put my hand up, I'm going to be embarrassed. The person next to me is going to see me. You know what? I'm not going to embarrass you, but even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to make his way in. He's not going to force his way in. He's already done everything he can by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess, hung naked on a cross for you and I, 
so that we can accept him today. The decision's yours. So who should raise their hand? If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you need to get your hand up. If you're not sure, don't leave this place today without making sure that is a gamble on your eternal life that you can't afford to make. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, in a moment I want you to pop your hand up. When you pop your hand up, what you're saying is I want to submit to God. I want to surrender my heart, my life to Jesus Christ and acknowledge that. You pop it up, I'll see it. You can put it right back down. All across this auditorium, all at the same time. I'm going to count to three. If that's you in this place, get ready. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I got you. Nine. Keep your hands up so I can see it. If you, if you got your hand up, put your hand up so I can see it. Ten, I got you back there. Ten wise people, where are you at? I got you, brother. Let me get your hand up. You got your hand up? 11, 12, 13, I see you. I got you guys back there. 14, okay, I see both of you. In the family rooms? Is there anybody in the family rooms? 14 wise people, where are you at? Number 15, you say, man, I wonder if I should do this. You should do this. Get your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it, put it right back down. If that's you in this house, let me see your hand today. Let's move forward for God. 14 wise people, where are you at? Number 15. Where are you at? Say, man, I wish this guy would shut up. I want to get out of here. Is there somebody in the family room? 15, praise God. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord, oh, 16, I got you. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Here's what I want to do. For those of you who raised your hand, for those of you who should have raised your hand, because there are more of, in here, more of you in here that should. I'm going to ask you to be bold. You don't get saved by popping your hand up. You get saved. You acknowledge that you need Jesus Christ by putting your hand up. You get saved by asking him to come into your heart, come into your life. So in a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, a friend, if you need a friend. Your purse, whatever it is that you've got with you, grab it. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair and come meet me at the altar. Let us pray with you. Let us help you today get Jesus Christ into your life. So if that's you, let's all stand. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on. You can come. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. You can come. Come on. Come on down. You can come. Won't you come? Just as you are. Come on down. You come. Come on down. The Spirit Come on, come on out of the family rooms, out of the upper sections. You come, come on. Come and see. Come on, you can come, you can come. do something. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here? This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is one of the nicest people you will ever meet. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. So what Pastor Dave is going to do is going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on, I promise. He's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free stuff, some free literature, a book that our senior pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. Very easy reading. He says, hey, I got saved. I gave my life to Jesus. Now what do I do from here? Help you get strong in the things of the Lord. He's going to invite you into a program that we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Like when you go to the gym and you see a personal trainer, somebody that helps you build those muscles and get real strong, we're going to invite you into a program where you meet a friend, somebody that will come alongside you, buy you a cup of coffee before service, and teach you some things about the Word of God, call you during the week to make sure you're strong and doing the things of the Word so that you don't go back to the junk that you came from, that you stay strong in the, word, in the ways of the Lord. That's a five-week program. And I want to ask you this. If you commit to that five-week program, you will be changed. I promise you that. 
And I want to tell you this, if you commit to one year here at the church, to stay, to sit under the word of God, to listen and to apply the word of God in your life, I promise you, you will not be the same. You will not be the same. So give us one year to listen, to sit under, to hear the word of the Lord. And you watch what God will do. If you guys would just turn to your right, my left, my right, my left. Go that way. Go that way. Praise God.